Thank you for joining us. We're excited to bring you a conversation with Colonel Edward Crute, the gap between special forces identity and the demands of great power competition. Special forces face different demands than the current great power competition than the mission requirements when founded in 1952. Key variables such as the scope, scale, and an adversary's speed are all critically impacted by today's environment. Our guest today is Colonel Ed Crute, whose 2020 Duke University dissertation on the topic identified fundamental disconnects between recruitment, training, and deployment for special forces to prepare adequately for future indirect operations with a more nimble adversary, such as Russia or China, leaders must create alignment between the personnel selected, their role, their expectations, their training, and the assignments. Recruiting alignment and training toward the mission are core elements of our focus here at Mission Essential. And preparedness with critical skills and the required tools are key components of global security today. The type of and diversity of threats demand ongoing development on this and, and discussion. As for my usual plug, Mission Essential is the largest provider of language services to DOD. We've completed over 100,000 missions with 20,000 linguists in 83 countries. And specific to US SOCOM, we have currently over 400 personnel in theater. Our services include language, intelligence, logistics, and training. We hope this conversation, as always, will inform and inspire you. Now, our guest, Colonel Ed Crute. He's the first Special Forces Command's Chief of Staff. He's a Green Beret with 25 years of service in the Army. He's commanded at the company and battalion level and served on operational assignments in Bosnia, Macedonia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Yemen, Zambia, Iraq, Bangladesh, and Jordan. Colonel Crute has interagency and policy experience from two U.S. Embassy assignments in Sana'a and Dhaka and multinational experience on both a UN and NATO staff. He recently completed the Counterterrorism and Public Policy Fellowship at Duke, Univers Duke University, where he conducted research on the current culture and identity of the U.S. Army Special Forces that I referenced previously. So welcome, Colonel Krupp, and thank you for being with us today. Great, thanks. Uh, happy to be here. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, so and again, the um, opportunity, I've had a chance to uh, um, actually watch um, the video of the dissertation presentation you did at, uh, at Duke, and certainly um, uh, some fascinating findings that you had, really digging into the data, uh, just really impressive stuff. So um, what, I, what I'd like to do is focus on uh, some of the key elements and pull the thread on some of the elements that you identified in there, uh, specifically on the current culture and identity challenges um, and what they are and what the command is currently doing to address the situation. So let's just start right off with what is the identity crisis in special forces? Right. Okay. I uh, appreciate that. Um, let, let me say up front, too, uh, to make sure that uh, this part is clear. The conversation we're having today that I'm super excited about is with Ed Crute, the uh, the researcher from Duke, and and you know so that we can have that conversation. I'm not endorsing anything, you know. I, I can't formally take the position from from First Special Forces Command, uh, but I absolutely am passionate about this topic. Um, identity crisis. I would like to set the table a little bit. Um, why did I do it? I'm often asked. There, there came a period when we started looking at the, the new national security strategy, um, and we were tackling this conversation or topic of competition with near peer. Um, and I started to hear some younger Green Berets talking, and they were what they were saying was unrecognizable to me. And so that's where I, I started to ask the question, wow, okay, I understand as a Green Beret what, what – our role is going to be in competition with and through our partners, et cetera. But, it, but I, I'm, I'm concerned at what I'm hearing. And so not that there's you know, anyone doing anything wrong, uh, but that's what got my attention. So off to Duke I went. Uh, I, I want to say that uh, it never would have happened, this research project, without courageous leadership. Uh, you know, Major General Robeson at the time was, is, is still at SWIC. Uh, he became one of my initial sponsors, uh, Lieutenant General Bodette at USASOC, you know, he endorsed the research, allowed me to survey the entire active duty population. Uh, and then when the research was done, Major General Brennan, once he heard the findings, absolutely said, hey, let's, let's not try and hide from this. Let's, let's hit it head on. And so that's important for, I think, leaders to understand is to have the courage to ask the hard questions about your organization. Okay. And so with that, um, I, I will say that when I say we have an identity crisis, uh, that initially can turn off 
some of our Green Berets because in some way that means I'm, I'm, I'm insinuating that they're doing something wrong or a lot of times when we say crisis in special operations, that means, wow, that we have to address that problem in 24 hours or there's going to be you know, a, a catastrophe. It's none of that. When I say identity crisis, it very much has to do with the behavioral science and the cultural definitions that are essentially that when you have an organization, uh, that across that organization, individuals are confused a little bit with its purpose, um, that you can have an identity crisis. And that can minimize uh, the effectiveness of that organization, not something you can't overcome uh, by addressing it. Okay, So that's pretty important, to, I think, to point out. Now, why I claimed that we have an identity crisis uh, is essentially that I, I found that I could bin my findings into three areas. The first area that, that came in at about 26% was a, was a segment population of, of active duty Green Berets that were very much focused on our direct action mission. So much so that they weren't valuing our language skills they weren't valuing our uh, ability to win the hearts and minds of our partners. They would, they would, uh, you know, they responded that, hey, you know what? If I can do the mission by myself, I don't need partners, um, and that it really was a kinetic direct action approach. So about 26 percent uh, came in on that. Uh, the next group, uh, which I called the legacy group. Um, recognized the importance of doing things through partners, but they were very uh, constrained by our old, our older unconventional warfare uh, definition uh, and, and approach. And they absolutely did not see any kind of contemporary role in competition for us. Okay, so they really looked at it like, yep, we'll, we'll be persistently present around the globe, but we're training our partners and building their partner capacity. We don't really have a counterterrorism role anymore. There is no, uh, you know, competition with near peer role. Um, and so that I, that's the group I called Legacy. They came in at about 28 percent, which leaves about 46 percent that I called the modern identity. And you know what what you should take away from that is, well, hey, I mean, I think that to some degree we are selecting, assessing, uh, recruiting, and then training and educating somewhat in the right way to have a 46% of our, of our population actually be that modern identity, which I mean is they understand you know, what Title 10 defines us as, what our roles are. They understand our, uh, the, the mission sets that the nation needs us to do, uh, what our doctrine says, and they can actually see and, and translate that into what's required in the modern environment in the new national security strategy, how we are going to compete against Russia and China. We're still keeping our eye on, on the counter VEO threat, um, Russia and China, and then how it's with and through we have a role to be able to, uh, to, to compete with those nations and, and reassure our partners and allies to choose us over them. So that, that's essentially what it was. And so if I was able to bin our population that way, well, then we clearly don't have one common understanding of who we are. And therefore, we do have that bifurcation uh, as an organization and an identity crisis does exist. So that, that's really the, the, the long and the short of, of, of why I claim that. Yeah, okay. No, and I appreciate you breaking it down. I think uh, certainly a brilliant um, kind of format to put it in, especially um, you know, the kind of kinetic kill side, obviously, is what you think of when you, <clears throat> when you watch movies about, um, you know, Delta guys or, or, you know, I'm, I, myself as a Marine certainly felt recruited into uh, Force Recon, you know, to, to, to get dirty and be the hardcore, you know, testosterone filled guy that is kinetically stabbing and killing things, right? That's the, that's what, that's what's advertised, right? Um, so, so let me, then let me, can I ask you a little bit more deeper on that in terms of you mentioned language and, and kind of the cultural aspect of it. And we've been talking uh, a lot with um, you know, some of your some of your colleagues, uh, Dr. Rasmussen and and, um, you know, certainly uh, Scott Mann and, and some others. 
about kind of this, the culture, um, the need for an un understanding of culture and empathy in being able to perform a mission that's, um, you know, that relies on partnerships with, uh, with other nations, other cultures. Um, so as, as we're kind of shifting into this new world of two plus three, the great power competition, um, can you, you know, talk a little bit about how language and culture play a role specifically with that with Green Berets um, and, and maybe even more specifically, like how has this shift in general disrupted um, kind of the, the ability for, you know, Green Berets or special forces in general to, to um, achieve the alignment with the mission today? Absolutely. Okay. Um, I think that what I'll do is I'll try and tie a thread to one of your other podcasts that you did with Scott Mann. Mm -hmm. uh, and so if Scott Mann says that, you know, he'd, he'd ask that we look at Green Berets like one part or an avatar of Rambo and an avatar of the Verizon guy who's building networks and relationships and an avatar of uh, Lawrence of Arabia, right, who uh, is understands that that presence, persistent presence with a partner, gaining their trust. It's okay if they do the mission 60% as well as maybe I can do, but it's the point that they're doing it um, for themselves, that uh, we're basically tying together their strategic objectives with U.S. strategic objectives, and that we can do that with an investment of only 12 Green Berets on an ODA that can actually influence 5,000 Kurds or Northern Iraq and Iraqi Kurds or Syrian Kurds or whoever the partner is, then that's, that's critical. That's the skill set. And so, you know, if you look at the identity crisis, when I said, hey, we have one and that we need to trans transform ourselves away from just the direct action my, my mindset that you talked about, I took a lot of criticism for that. Um, and I think where folks were a little confused is I wasn't saying that a Green Beret is not a warrior. You absolutely have to be a subject matter expert at the base of, of, of how, to, how to conduct war, uh, conduct a raid, conduct a reconnaissance, um, probably more so than if you do them unilaterally. Because your job, A, is to convince someone else to do that with you, by, with, and through you. And I'll tell you, uh, anyone, this will immediate re immediately resonate with anyone. If you go into an African uh, organization or, like I said, some northern Iraqi Kurds or, you know, somewhere in Asia like Thailand, where our partners have grown up with an AK-47 at their bedside, if you're not a warrior, you're never going to be able to influence them to do anything. And so you better be a subject matter expert. You better be the warrior that's willing to go through the, the door first, et cetera, and so on. Know your craft. Uh, so it's not to say you're not a warrior. You have to be to be able to influence folks in that way. So that, that skill set is a baseline. Being that, that Rambo avatar is a baseline. It's just applied in a different way. Now, next piece is um, why is it so important to have the language skill – the, the cultural maturity and understanding and skills to be able to influence folks. Um, because, you know, that's, that's the criticality of it. I, I'm going to say something sometimes people ra raise their eyebrows at, but it, it's an important understanding and comparison. If you look at the situation that, uh, that President Obama found himself in, when all of a sudden everybody woke up and, surprise, ISIS has stormed across Syria and occupied a huge swath of Iraq, okay? When you talk to some of my academic advisors from, from Duke uh, and UVA, they were on the National Security Council at that time, they'll be the first to tell you that, hey, putting 18-year-old American boots on the ground from the 82nd Airborne back into Iraq or Syria is not a policy option. So what is that, you know, in, in the toolbox uh, for, for, our, for the United States of America, what is that tool that you can pull out that can go into Iraq, partner with not only the Iraqi government, but also the northern Iraqi Kurds, two different entities, um, in a very small and politically uh, palatable formation and force structure of hundreds, not thousands, of U.S. soldiers? Um, 
it can partner with them. It can advise and assist and provide them, you know, some of our, you know, air cover and maybe targeting capabilities. Drive ISIS and and eliminate their physical caliphate in in Iraq, push them across the border, say goodbye to those Iraqi partners, and then hello to northern Syrian Kurd partners. Continue to dismantle the uh, ISIS physical caliphate. Then deal in an environment where you're not only dealing with ISIS, but you're uh, dealing with the Syrian government forces, Turkish forces, and irregular and conventional forces, northern, northwestern Syrian um, Al Qaeda. So we'll call it AQ3, part three. Um, you have a little bit of Iranian Quds Force there. Uh, you've also got uh, a couple, a couple of other, you know, the Russians irregular forces are there, very, very well documented and, and open source. Who is the force that can culturally um, handle themselves and and be able to influence that many different partners? That's why it's you, you don't fake that. You can't surge that trust. It's got to be authentic. And if you don't understand the importance of language, if you don't understand the importance of respecting the culture, then there's no way that, that you can achieve that. And, you know, so it's, it's funny. Try this experiment on your own. Ask someone today, hey, whatever did happen to ISIS? You remember when they made it all the way across Iraq and, and it became a major problem. But you often are not sure what happened to it. What's its, where is it today? What's going on? Well, um, 11 Americans lost their lives in that you know, two to three year campaign. 11,000 Kurds did. And I'm not trying to say that that's a, you know, I'm not trying to be a, a cold hearted individual that's saying, hey, look at that measure of performance. But that's really important to understand. The United States invested a very small group of folks back into that problem set that advised, assist, and worked with our partners and allies who had the same strategic objective to eliminate the, the ISIS caliphate. Um, and that was successful. Now, it doesn't mean ISIS has gone away. It had to seed. It's, you know, it has to survive now in the virtual space, and, and it's finding other ways to reinvent itself. But that's an example of a very unique force that has to have a very unique respect and understanding of languages, cultures, and the importance of working with and through other partners to achieve a, to, to achieve objectives like that. And that's the crux of what we're trying to say. Um, it's not that uh, you know direct action is wrong. We needed we needed sensitive uh, special reconnaissance skills. We needed unconventional warfare skills. We needed direct action targeting skills to be able to do what we did. But it's how a very small group can leverage allies and partners to be able to, to get after it, which is the point. That's the change. That's the, hey, the, the identity that we need to focus on, have that northern star that we can all orient on to, to do that mission set that I just described. I, ho I hope that tries to, to seed all of those, those topics yeah. together, Brian. No, it, it, it does, and I appreciate that. I mean, but the, the obvious next question um, that, at least in my um, knuckle-dragger head, is, is that even possible? You know, I mean, you've, you're, you're asking for, um, and, I, and I appreciate the reference back to uh, Scott Mann's, you know, uh, <laughs> aptly put Verizon, Lawrence Arabia, and Rambo. Um, but, you know, it, when you're looking for someone who can, you know, maintain a level of expertise in a language, a cultural understanding, and be able to, you know, jump out of something and, you know, pass the physical, um, you know, requirements of being, being special forces, you know, qualified, how, how much can we actually, I mean, you said it yourself, you can't surge trust, but you can't, is it even possible to surge the functional elements that you're listing out here in the new identity? That's a great question. Um, okay. I'm thinking about using another uh, example for language to kind of illustrate this. Um, but before I do, it has to come down to balance. I had, I had multiple Green Berets right in the free tech section that it is achievable, what you said. You just have to have balance. As long as they understand what you're asking them to accomplish, they can balance 
sixty percent of their training time on the on the, on the you know stay alive and combat skills, right? The ability to be able to fight uh, and win and survive in those kind of environments and the skills it takes. When you talk about the intangible cultural and language skills, okay, um, one warrant officer CW three in my mind, uh, very you know he I have him his quote in mind to me where he said, hey look. I stay warm on my language. Uh, I'm never going to be a three-three in a, in Arabic, right? Uh, but I but I am going to maintain my one plus one plus. I can do that on my 20-minute ride to and from work three times a week by just, you know, touching my language, right? Staying warm with it. What he means, and what I agree so much with, is uh, and I'll use this story as an example. Um, it's much less about we're not asking our formation to translate the front page of a newspaper or you know listen in on signals intelligence and be able to provide a perfect transcript it's about the respect when you try to speak someone's language to the culture and to them and, and I'll, I'll give you this story so i'm an arabic speaker uh for, that's my, my my sf language when i was out at special operations command pacific and i got assigned as the um the pat team leader a Pacific Augmentation team leader had 13 special operators under me in the dock of Bangladesh Embassy. I said, well, as a Green Beret, I know this is 2012. I said, I, I, I don't speak Bangla, but I'm going to try. And so I contacted SOCOM. They sent me literally this headset, the same one I'm using right now. And they said, okay, we can give you two hours, two days a week with a Bangla instructor for about three months. That's it. That's all I did. Tuesdays and Thursdays, did a long lunch, practiced. I probably got dangerous with about 250 words in, in Bangla, Bangla, and uh, that's it. I went into country, and I certainly tried with my driver and the embassy guards every day, et cetera, and so out. I, I, I was conversational, but probably sounded pretty funny to them. About third month in, the uh, ambassador said, okay, we've got all the big DOD uh, bigwigs coming in. I, Admiral Swift at the time, the 7th Fleet Commander was coming in with my Special Operations Command Pacific uh, two-star General Brosnick. Um, and we were having this big DOD, DO, U.S. DOD to Bangladeshi military exchange. And um, I made it into the room as a lieutenant colonel, barely. Uh, and I was all the way down on the end of our delegation's line. And um, we went through, and I had only one, I had one equity that I had to represent. And so they went down the line, and when it got to me, I introduced myself uh, and said my one equity line to them in Bangla. And the, uh, the four-star army general, who actually was the equivalent of their joint chief, their army is, the, is by far the biggest service for them, he stands up, he walks across the room, ambassadors there, I mean, everybody's there. He walks across the room, and I rise to meet him, and he gives me a hug. And he turns, and he says uh, to all of the officers there, this is the first Western officer that has tried to speak our beautiful language. Whatever you need, Colonel, you've got. And, and he walked back, right? And I say that because, obviously, I, I'm sure that I butchered what I said. But I demonstrated the respect for their language and their culture to try. And that's what that's what it is all about. Right. I yeah, mean, the crazy. ability, the ability to, um, you know, if you're going to ask somebody to stand shoulder to shoulder with you toward our both of our nation's objectives, then you better be able to respect them enough to try, uh, try their their culture, try their language, try their food, uh, try to do things and understand them their way. So yeah. hopefully that makes sense. Now, to the larger question, you can do that. I mean, you know, if you've got a hundred hours to prepare for a mission, I, I I say you should take about seventy-five to make sure that your formation can survive and fight in combat. That's our job. That's the baseline. But I also believe that professionally, you can spend some time on the culture. You can spend some time on understanding the the country. Um, you know, uh, the, the, what it takes to 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 survive in that culture and the respect for that culture and the language and everything else. Um, so I do think it's possible. Last thing I would say, this is now, now if we're talking about, if we want to add in another layer of our experiences, all of us, the fact that I have uh, my, I'm sitting next to my dog at my house and we're conducting this, uh, you know, this podcast is the COVID environment and what we're learning. 
we're really starting to think about this relationship piece for Green Berets where, you know, up until this point, it's been like, hey, I am this ODA in this regionally aligned special forces group and I'm I speak Thai and Thais are my partners. We really only would touch them at most about once a year. You know, we'd go over on a J set, et cetera, and so on. Well, we're asking the question now, if the national security strategy is asking us to be persistently present present with our partners and allies, well, I think we're learning that I can probably do that all the time now. Why can't I, as a Green Beret, have Zoom calls with my Thai counterterrorism unit partner once a week? Right. What says we can't have VTCs once a month as units and, and really start to thicken that relationship? And so, um, you know, I, I kind of add that in to that's also the way we're looking and thinking about this to, to be better partners. Um, and so, yeah, the answer to your question, it's hard, but with balance, I absolutely think it's achievable. And so does our, our commanders. That's great. And it's a great, uh, example you gave too. And um, I, I won't bore um, our audience with um, long stories of my own, but as a young Marine, I think I was a corporal maybe, I was dropped into Tunisia as the only Arabic linguist with 2000 Marines. Um, I was then uh, basically made aware of the fact that they don't really speak Arabic in Tunisia, it's more French. Um, and I didn't speak French. Uh, so I can certainly appreciate the scenario that you, you drum up. And um, while they probably laughed at me when I tried to speak the uh, pure Arabic uh, in Northern Africa, uh, they certainly appreciated it. And I got some bread and milk out of the deal. So, um, so anyway, uh, perfect example. But no, that's great. Um, that's great. Hey, you know what? One other point, too, is um, it, it's so important for your own protection. Right. I mean, you know, if. Like, I'll just take the Dhaka Bangladesh example again. You know, I, my life was entrusted to my driver, who was an embassy personnel, right? He was an embassy employee and, you know, just trying to speak the culture, going to his house to eat dinner, right? Which, yes, I got sick after. That's okay. <laughs> um, it, it, that it, – it's, it's immeasurable. You know, if I think about Save Your Ammo and, and uh, the book that Dr. Rasmussen put together, it's a very good read – it, it talks about that, that side of it. Like, Hey, I mean, you know, th you're going to make a personal bond with your partners. That's, that's not superficial. It's real. And, you know, they're, they're gonna be able to clue you in, in, in environments around the world that, Hey, maybe we better not, let's not drive today. This is what I'm hearing in, in the, you know, in, in the news, or we're not going to go to that part town. We're going to take 20 minutes longer, sir, to drive today because we're going to go around these couple of neighborhoods I don't think we should go through anymore. So it's another example of why the language, the culture, and the respect for it is so important. But, yeah. yeah. No, it's great. It's great. And, I, and you know, it's certainly building trust is the, the key uh, kind of always ever-present goal here. I mean, you can't, um, you can't do things without partners, and you can't have a partner without trust, and you need empathy to build that trust. And kind of it's that you know, constant cycle. So. Um, so, you know, as we kind of go down this road a little bit more and maybe bring it back to um, not, not to make you a representative of First Special Forces Command in this discussion, but at least just from that perspective, um, you know, you, you guys changed your uh, command vision and mission statement late last year. And, and so I just kind of wanted to check in on that in, in terms of the plan for, um, you know, how you're going to align your recruitment and training and deployment kind of aspects based on kind of everything you just said. And more specifically, does that negatively impact your existing pipeline of candidates? Okay, yeah, it's a good question. Um, I'll break it in two parts. I'll cover the, the, the question of will it negatively impact our candidates? Um, I'll, I'll, let me th I'll think about that. I'm, I'm going to separate that one. Remind, come back to that with me again. Sure. On the front side to give an update on vision, everything else. Yeah. So um, if, if anyone ever reads the, the, the research paper that I did, uh, two major findings out of that. Number one was that, uh, again, trying to not a behavioral scientist, but that was a benefit of doing your, your war college fellowship at a university like Duke was, man, I'll tell you, just being able to plug into the PhDs and get their support on all this was huge. I mean, they, they listened to my research findings and were able to then apply some science to what we came out with. But 
the concept of socialization, meaning when you're going to bring somebody into an organization, um, they're going to go through three, three stages or phases, right? I'm not going to use the science words because frankly, I can't remember them. But the ba basically, the first part was you're going to recruit them. You're going to attract them to your organization. Then you're going to ind indoctrinate them into your organization, think training and education. And then they're going to formally become part of your organization and begin to work in your organization, right? And so um, you have to be very uh, attuned to how socialization works to have a successful culture, right? When they looked at our organization, they were like, it's no wonder that you guys have an identity crisis. Who would try and do that across three separate two-star headquarters, right? Mm -hmm. So that was really important. And, and you know, I think not to speak for General Marks, our deputy commanding general, and General Brennan, who were, who was who brought me, it changed my orders and had me come on as the chief of staff because I said, "Hey, you need to help us through this." Um, yeah, we we had to approach it holistically in this way because if you only fix a component of this, you're still going to have the problem. You can't. You have to address the whole thing. So, um, with that. Uh, over top of all this, you have to have a Northern Star. That's what the vision was. That's why the first step that we took was to say, okay, where is this organization trying to go? And we need to identify it. And that became the vision. Uh, I give General Brennan a lot of credit. He was very patient with us. He described what he thought. He had a, our team go out and start to put this together. And then he said, hey, now send it out to the 24,000. Let's get their thoughts. And then let's send it out to our retired formation, right? Some of our retired generals and their thoughts and over to SWIC and up to USASOC. I mean, we, we pushed it around three different cuts of this we did. And actually the latest was just published and sent out today. So you have and just there's a couple changes in there uh, or updates, which is fine. And I'll, I'll make sure you guys have a copy and we'll, we will actually publish it again. Um, but really took, you know, the approach we took was you'll never get it 100% right. Let's just try and be, one, less wrong, and number two, as inclusive as we possibly can with all the stakeholders. So if we had some pockets of thought out there that, that we didn't include, we tried to bring them in. And, and so that was important. So now that we have a Northern Star, the next phase is let's go first to the recruiting side. We've uh, worked with USASOC and our special operations recruiting uh, battalion. Uh, and we have put about four months in with PSYOPs, civil affairs, and special forces to craft the right message and narrative for who we're looking for to do this mission that we describe in the vision. Um, and so we are right in the final approval phases of that to hopefully have about 80% right and authentic narrative. Because here's the problem. If you recruit people for with short-term goals of, hey, I need to make my numbers, and in any way you mislead them, that is going to catch up to you at some other phase of this socialization process. They're going to be unhappy in, in the training and education going, what's going on here? Or they're going to get to the organization and they're going to be like, okay, I am not satisfied. This is not what I wanted to do. So don't cheat it. Be authentic up front in your, in your, in your um, recruiting. It's only going to build the, it's going to bring in the right people. It's going to make your organization stronger. It's, you know, do it authentically. So we're doing that up front. In the middle, I honestly don't think that our special warfare um, center in school, what we call SWIC, you know, John F. Kennedy under General Robeson, I think they were doing really good. I mean, I don't, we don't really see that there's a lot of major changes there. Um, it really was, we were maybe bringing some folks in under, uh, you know, that were looking for the d direct action mission and they, you know, they went into the Q course and okay, they, they went through, it, they really kind of figured out on the backside, like maybe this isn't exactly what I want to do. So. SWIC, I mean, they're, they're a part of this, you know, great leadership there, uh, you know, like adjusting a little bit and making sure they're, they're looking at the mission that we're, the, the vision that we're talking about on the operational side. 
Um, there'll probably probably be some tweaks there, but I don't think there'll be major changes. I don't think they were needed. I think it's a it's a heck of a pipeline uh, that that they have. So, um, but you want to make sure that part's aligned. And then now on the first special for forces command side, right? Because we are the operational headquarters that's employing uh, the force. We have to make sure that our training guidance and how we are employing the force is con consistent with those messages, right? Or, or that vision. So what I mean by that is if we're allowing training schedules to be approved that are 95%, you know, halo jumps and uh, mount site takedowns unilaterally, then we're not authentically and, and we're not staying authentic to what the vision is and holding the leadership accountable for, you know, training and education for, for what we're asking them to do. A big part of that too, this didn't come out of the identity crisis. This really, this comes out of General Baudet, General Brennan, General Robeson, their vision and, and where we need to go. Hey, the cyber, the information domain, uh, the space domains, these are huge growth areas that we're behind in, that our force has to be a tune in. So we got to make that part of the training, the education, and, and what, we're, what we're putting our resources to, toward for our folks to be able to um, exercise and experiment in. So um, you got to get that backside right as well uh, if, uh, if, if you want to be able to stay consistent to the vision and have a force that has a unified understanding of its purpose and, and can defeat that identity crisis. Um, so that's the answer to the first question, and I haven't forgotten the second question. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's been there. I'm not sure if I have a great answer for it, but I do believe that there are people just like me that were attracted to the by, with, and through mission as a Green Beret. And it's just a matter of, you know, the sexy, if you will, is not the door kicking part of it, the bin Laden raid. The sexy is, hey, me and 11 other Green Berets and three other PSYOP professionals and two other civil affairs professionals with a cyber and a space and a, an Intel professional cross-functional team together, the 20 of us Americans is going to go in bed with a thousand Northern Iraqi Kurds, Afghani partners, Thai partners, um, whoever it is, and we're going to achieve U.S. strategic objectives, not tactical objectives, strategic objectives, very quietly uh, for our nation. And to do that, I got to be able to survive in that environment. I got to be able to convince and influence my partner that I'm, I'm ready to bear the burden and share the burden to accomplish our, our you know, combined strategic goals for our nations. Um, that's, there are people out there that are very attracted to that mission. And if you can talk about that authentically up front and let them know this is the elite organization that you're about to join, this is the mission, then I don't think we'll have uh, a problem in recruiting those folks because I think they're equally out there. Um, we just got to make sure we get up, get it right, that narrative up front. So we're bringing in the right people to begin with. And so that's, uh, that, that's my thoughts on this, on the second part of that question. No, that's great. And I think that, I mean, you hit, you're hitting it on the head in terms of, you know, the authentic message, if it is your, if it is an authentic narrative and, you know, if the advertising poster that, that drew you in was, was literally Rambo, um, then you're going to be pretty disappointed for most Green Berets, at least, um, that that isn't necessarily what your daily job is. There's a lot more to it to buy with and through, as you just mentioned. So, um, so I think you're, I, I definitely agree. I think you're right. Um, and I, I guess uh, one little last question, if you'll indulge me on that piece, is does it, we talked about the pipeline of candidates, but what about the existing core? Um, you know, if, you, if, you if you're trying to change your identity, what happens to the people who are already identifying as the, uh, as the DA side or the legacy yep. side? No, it's a great question. Um, so we did a, so we have a podcast as well at First Special Forces Command. Uh, we began it back, I think, in October, uh, September. Um, and, uh, one of our, I think our, our November and December three part series was, Hey, forget about what the officers think. Right. Uh, we asked our, uh, legendary command sergeant majors, four of them that are retired and three of them that are on active duty. One of them is actually a metal, 
of honor winner, um, Sergeant Major Williams. Um, and, you know, we said, hey, we, let's put this conversation into the core of our culture, you know, the NCOs. And uh, l- let's uh, l- let's hear what they have to say about this. And, you know, I, I, not to speak on their behalf, but essentially what they were talking about was, you know, the folks that maybe came in for that, they're going to find their way toward that, right? I mean, there, there still are, there's some hard target defeat companies that may uh, fill that need for them. Some may want to now try and go over and go to some other selections for some other organizations that do this mission, which is very needed. Like I'm not saying this mission isn't important, the unilateral mission. Absolutely, it's important. We have special tools for that, right? But, uh, and also, they felt that several of those, you know, uh, maybe that came in for that mission will, as long as you explain why it's important, the skill is important, but it's the skill and the ability to teach that, less doing it your own, will also satisfy a, a large group of others too. And that if as leaders, you can give common purpose to them so they understand it, that many of those will, will be like, yeah, okay, that's okay. I'm, I'm still good with it. But there'll always be a percentage as well to say, okay, I understand where the organization is trying to go, and that's not why I joined. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to exit the organization, and, and, and that's completely fine, uh, you know, that, that we're not going to be able to change, and that's okay. You know, we, want, we want them to be happy too, right? When I, w- I was a recruiting battalion commander for two years, from 2015 to 2017, and I watched thousands – of interviews, discussions, recruiters, parents, families, teachers, young men and women. And, you know, I am convinced that you get nothing out of uh, not authentically bringing someone into your organization because at some point they're going to figure it out and that's only going to cost you more work as the organization. Because once they're not satisfied, now you've got somebody that's not happy. They're not performing. They're going to leave. You got a gap. So it doesn't help anybody. Um, so, you know, no hard feelings if people want to leave, no problem. But also we believe many will, for multiple reasons, be like, okay, good. As long as I understand what you want me to do, I'm, I'm fine. I, I can reorient myself. So, yeah, I appreciate that. And I think it's certainly that's just part of, part of change, right? You have to, um, you, you adjust and you, and you lose and you hope you win more than you lose, right? <laughs> um, so let me um, go down a little bit um, of this road, a little, uh, not to say that you're on the fringe, uh, but I think you're definitely in the forefront of, certainly in the special forces world of this type of need for identity change or, or adjustment, if you will. Um, you know, as, as we address, or as, you know, the first special forces command addresses the needs for these change, um, what, how, do you, uh, how do you deal with the fact that future uh, policies or external elements in general might conflict with your desire to change. And I guess I don't mean to be vague, but um, some, you know, s- specific examples being, you know, the need to have a, um, a, a different set, set of requirements that you had accounted for that don't play into your kind of baseline or, or any other scenario you can think of that would conflict with your new kind of alignment, if you will. Okay. No, that's, that's a great question. Um, I'm a big big one for context. So uh, I'll, I'll tackle it in this way. Um, so when I showed up as the chief of staff uh, and General Brennan had already outlined his four lines of effort, um, his, the first one was people. The second one was readiness. The third one was innovation. And the fourth one was relationships. The third one, innovation, was different from the Army's third line of effort and use of socks, third line of effort. So General Brennan was modifying that third line of effort. So that caught my attention. Like, okay. So I said, sir, what do you mean by that? You know, what does the word innovation mean to you versus modernization? And, uh, you know, he explained it to me. And I said, sir, you know, I think that folks are going to struggle with this a little bit. And so let's do an innovation symposium. Okay. And, and let's, let's try and, you know, your look at this and understanding of it. Let's bring a bunch of other examples of that in and let's have the conversation so we can better understand what you mean by that. And so with that, 
we brought in um, a bunch of folks, and uh, what came out of it was, A, our first Special Forces Command definition of modernization and innovation. And so what we came away with was modernization is taking what you already have and make it better. Okay. And so if you, as an organization, your latest lessons of a multi-domain environment are Syria, right? Where, remember I described before, you've got now, you've got Russia, Turkey, Syria, you've got this like mosh pit, as General Brennan likes to say, of uh, different capabilities. And they're starting to use new convergence technology, right? They're cyber, space, electronic jamming, that's all starting to come in. We weren't used to that. 15 years against not a near peer, right? Just in, in the, in the, in the um, counterterrorism fight. And so uh, what we were doing, we were modernizing, right? We were making what we had a little bit better. How do I take the radio I have and make it a little better? And the, I don't know. What we, what we, what innovation means to our organization is two things. Number one, you have to not fight the last war. That's, we are guilty of that. In, D, in the United States military. I mean, that is what we are famous for <laughs> on the academic side, looking at military campaigns. And so it's hard. It's hard not to do that. But you have to ask the hard question, what does my organization uniquely do for the nation? Now, what does that mission look like in the future operating environment of 2035, 2040? You, you got to break – you have to separate yourself from what you, your, you, what you know, your experience, and ask that hard question. And then when you do, you have to ask the third component of that, which brings in innovation. Now, what do I need to do to accomplish my mission in that environment that I don't have right now? Capabilities. And you don't ask it just about – we all like to just say, well, what thing do I need? What piece of technology? No. It's a dot mil PFP look at your gaps. And I'll, I'll spell that acronym out because I know not everybody's military. But you got to look at your doctrine, your organization, um, your training and exercising, um, your um, materiel, your dot, uh, leadership, your personnel, your facilities that you have. And then your policies or rules or laws. You have to look at all of that and ask, does this make any sense for us to be able to, uh, to accomplish it? And what are the gaps? Now we've got to innovate on that and what's new. Okay. And so notice the last P in that is policy. Because a lot of times we are our own worst enemy with policies and rules that we put in place that our enemy doesn't have, or our adversary doesn't have, that kills us. And so, um, you know, I, I will use uh, information, what's happening right now, as an example. And so Ed Crute, Ed Crute is making the statement that we are really far behind in information warfare, and yes, we are at war right now with Russia and China and others in the information space. OK, and we have got a lot of catching up to do there, um, and we need to understand that we're being lapped every day in the information space, and it's hurting us. Um, and that's not just that's not just DOD's responsibility. That's that's our government's responsibility. Um, however, when you look at, at a concept like influence and psychological operations, which we actually do have the corner on the market in DOD and our command for that capability, um, we have got to change the way that we're thinking, and we've got to start innovating now on influence and, and what that means. And influence in the information space and how to deliver that in the cyber domain and what that means uh, through the ability for space and the electronic warfare spectrum to influence that, we have got to innovate on that now. We are behind and we are losing. We don't even realize how much damage is being done to us daily in that space. So that's, you know, th that's the long and the short of kind of how we're tackling that uh, and yeah. looking at the problem. And I think, you know, I, 
I think the, I, I'm really, really impressed with how General Brennan, my boss now, has, has had the foresight to say, it's not just modernization. We've got to attack this problem of innovation uh, and how we approach it. And so that's a little bit of Ed Crute and a little bit of how we're doing it also at First SFC um, yeah, yeah. To, to answer that. Yeah, I mean, the concept of innovating on influence, I think, is something uh, – it's definitely a theme lately that we've been talking about, and I couldn't agree with you more. So, um, you know, as we, so – and, and you, as you just said, you know, preparing for our next war as if it was the last is, you know, it's not going to work anymore. It doesn't, it's not effective. Um, so, so let me just ask you a question along those lines, and, you, you know, we can make the change now, right? You've got some great ideas and certainly in your dissertation, you've broken up your 95 archetypes and you know, you, you know the 25 that you surveyed and you know, and the, the detail and the data you got from that, I think is gonna um, already has and it's certainly in the vision you have um, released today and, and some of these other elements are going to impact a change that are gonna, it's gonna take place now. But my question to you on this is how do we uh, put in place a continual um, adjustment that it becomes organic to the SF identity so that it evolves as the world around us evolves? Like, is there some um, foundational element of the process that needs to adjust so that it can continually change? Does that make sense? Uh, so, that, so that you mean our organization can keep pace with change? Well, yeah, certainly keep pace with change, but but almost a self-validating uh, process to make sure your identity is in check with what's needed around you, right? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, let me think. I, I don't, I've got some thoughts, but I don't think it's going to 100% answer the specific question you're, you're answering. But let, let, me, let me give it a shot. Um, so I think if you can get the people right up front, and these types of people are going to think this way, then they're going to hold the they're going to hold the, the the echelons accountable for that. Okay, so this goes a little bit into the the front side work we've been doing to try and say, hey, if this is the vision, who are the people we're after? What are the archetypes and the and the attributes of those people? And you know, I'm going to use the word innovative. Okay as one of the archetypes or the attributes that we want our folks to have. Underneath that, this is not Webster's Dictionary. This is just kind of our talking. Um, when I say innovative, I mean problem solvers. They weaponize curiosity. They have an open mind. Um, they listen you know, to all sides. Uh, they're not bound by artificial constraints in their thinking. Um, those are the, and they have, they, they're intellectual, right? I mean, they have intellectual curiosity, they have intellect, you know, all those kind of things. That's what we mean by an innovative person. And when you put innovative, innovative people together on teams, you can give them problems and they're, they're going to be able to work their way through towards solutions, right? And I think that is one big way that that we can continue to stay on top of, you know, stay ahead of change in the environment. Because um, this is only going to get faster, right? We are in an information revolution. And because of that, change is going to be constant. And you have got to be able to keep up with that. Literally, like, and this is part of what our struggle is right now. Um, as we're trying to to provide some of the uh, resourcing for General Brennan's vision, for example, an information warfare center, a special operations forces training concept that allows us to have a um, experimental environment against a multi-domain cyber space information electronic warfare environment. Um, to, 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 for folks, for, for our soldiers to like be emerged in that environment and have to think quickly through those changing uh, dynamics. 
that's that takes a, a certain type of person, and we got to get that right up front. And if you put those people together, they're going to be able to innovate quickly and survive and achieve results in those environments. Um, number one, I'll say. Number two, uh, I'm going to go off on on an academic red herring for a second. A year and a half ago at the Army War College, one of the big themes was this idea that in the military, we're stuck by end states, right? And so if, if you take the, the global war on terror end states that were actually given to us by, by the president, no, no fault of his, but he told us to defeat terrorism. And in any countries we do that, we want to make a democracy there, okay? If you think about that today, and we all lived in that experience, right? Anyone that served de State Department, Department of Defense, we were all together trying to, you know, CIA, you name it. We were all together trying to figure that out. Those were probably unachievable end states. And so what the Army War College proposed about a year and a half ago is that, you know, when we're campaigning, these campaignings are actually probably limitless. And this idea of competition we probably should stop thinking about absolute end states and more about staying, you know, staying dominant in competition and managing these problems through innovation and being able to adjust rapidly than a concept of winning. And if we don't change, you know, authorities and uh, policies and resourcing solutions that we have right now in a glacial cold war system then it's going to be hard for us to do that even the most innovative people even if we can put them together in teams are going to be fighting and railing against some other parts of this you know process and system that, that might prevent that if you want to re be, read a book that alerts us to that kill chain i know we've talked about this before um Chris Brose, who was senior policy uh, advisor to uh, the late Senator McCain, wrote a book called Kill Chain in the last two years, which talks about Senator McCain's uh, definition, or he called it the Iron Triangle. What used to be the, um, the uh, uh, military industrial complex, he added Congress on top of that, and he called it the Iron Triangle and just said, man, the world is, you know, the adversary is moving faster. They watched, they've been watching us and they're, they're moving in the information space, the cyberspace much, much faster than we are. And if we don't figure out how to break this iron triangle, um, you know, we're not going to get there. So um, <sighs> your question was, what can we do as an organization to make sure we don't, uh, I, I think we got to have the right people and we got to ask the hard questions and have the courage to ask the hard questions and be willing to break some of these Cold War era systems and, and create systems that are going to move much faster to keep up with the innovation that's required of us to be successful in this competition space. Because another book, if you want to read uh, uh, Sean McFate's um, New Rules of War, his proposal is you're probably never going to go to war again. You know, the nation state understands that you're not going to achieve your ultimate goals if you go to war because you're going to break your own country. Uh, you know, you may win in the long run, but you will do so much damage. You're, you're not going to be able to achieve your goals. So we're really all going to operate in this high state of competition rather than ever going into conflict. So you better be good at that. Um, you know, he points to, if you think about Russia, the second Russia, they're competing all over the place, right? The second they're, you know, hired contractors, um, you know, fall into trouble somewhere, say Syria or wherever they're competing, they just deny it. It's obvious they're Russian contractors, but okay, that's, we're not going to go, I'm not, you're not, I'm not going to allow this to cross into a formal conflict line, but I'm going to do everything I can in the competition space. And so, you know, if that's the new rules of war, then we need to really be able to concentrate on that space. And back to First Special Forces Command, we believe that we are uniquely trained and suited for that irregular warfare competition environment that is so important. We're in 70 countries. We are strategic sensors to see and sense this activity from our 
you know, Chinese, Russian, Iranian, uh, North Korean adversaries and the act activities of VEOs and that our ability to see and sense that and warn everybody, partners, and then as partners deal with that uh, comes in, co becomes incredibly important. Back to the importance of culture. <laughs> yeah. No, that's a that's a great <laughs> a great segue to our uh, kind of summary here, and and that's the point. I mean, if you can if you can understand each other, uh, both uh, inside your own organization and and in your partners and strategic uh, alliances, then you're going to be more effective, and that's the point. Um, man, I mean, you like I can't tell you how um, how grateful I am for for. The, just just going through and watching the um, the video on your dissertation at Duke. I mean, it's the the work you put in. It's so ground. It's I think it's you know cliche, but saying the word groundbreaking. But it really is because for the first time, it's, it seems like um, someone from within the organization. I'm sure other behavioral scientists have have studied um, you know the for example the problems with Marines forever. You know what I mean? I'm you know I'm probably a case study for that. Um, but for someone from the from the Green Berets, from someone who's in, actively in it, to do a study like this, to put in the research and to come to come up with all this data, that is just invaluable. I can't can't tell you how impressed uh, I am personally, and how great I think it is for our industry that you're doing this work. So, kudos and and you know full appreciation there. No thanks, and uh, you know, change is hard, and it doesn't happen unless you have. Courageous leaders. So all the generals I mentioned in the beginning that said, "Yeah, do it." You know, it's going to hurt, I'm sure, but let, let's let's take it. We love our organization. We know it's important for the nation, so we owe it to 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 be honest and be be honest stewards of that capability. Let's get it right. That's the front yeah. side. The other side is, you know, the other plug is when all of our you know DoD students get those opportunities to go to Command and General Staff College or uh, into the war college and whether you're doing it, you know, on location in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, or you get the opportunity to do it in industry with a partner nation, or like I did it at, at one of our highly recognized universities like Duke, take advantage of that. That's what they told me. They said, Hey, ask a hard question about your own formation, make it worthwhile. Uh, so, you know, that's what launched me into it. But then you have all these incredible PhDs, right? Uh, research experts, behavioral scientists experts, cultural experts, policy experts that, you know, just dove in with me and were able to help me through all this, like organize the study and the methodology and then take all the data I had and, and try and give some tangible recommendations. I mean, that's, that's the other side of it. So, you know, it's, it's a great system and process we have for, for our, our military professionals to have these opportunities, make the most of it. Yeah, so that's great. Yeah, and and you know I'll I'll do my best. Please, um, you know, jump in if I'm if I'm miscategorizing something. But I mean, I do my best to kind of summarize everything you went through, which was exhaustive but very efficient, I'd say. Um, you know, so you started off with the the three identities, obviously. And and um, if if you're watching and you haven't and you, you're interested in this stuff, I definitely would check out um, uh, Colonel Crude's dissertation on this. Um, but the the 95 archetypes down to the 25 and those and the, and then coming up with those three identities um, of the direct action, the legacy, the modern, um, I think, you know, just identifying those three in those categories makes it really um, easy for people like me, at least, to understand uh, the, the challenge that you guys have in front of you. Um, but, but key amongst that is that you still need to be a warrior. And I love that you brought that into um, what I would call, I, I know you referenced uh, Scott Mann's uh, Verizon guy, Lawrence Arabia. Um, you know, Rambo example, but but it, more from from your perspective, maybe you call it um, more of your new modern SF Renaissance man, if you will. Um, but you know, the the person that's really um, going to continue to change, as you just mentioned, continue to change with the world around you. I think that's going to be key. Um, yeah. can, can I say something on that? Yeah, please. Yeah. So you know, I, I probably should have said this earlier. Really. So if you go to special forces, uh, our our major training final training exercise before you get your green beret it's called robin sage it's generally based on a little bit of a vietnam uh model but all that all that you know 
the theory of resistance and unconventional warfare, it's the same. You just have to overlay it to the modern environment, right? So yeah. the same guerrilla and auxiliary and, and um, you know, networks that you need to build, you can do that virtually. You can do that in a cyber or information denied environment. I mean, you can, you can build a team through social media, right? I mean, so that, that's the point is, is how do you do it on the modern, in the modern environment? You know, and that's, that's really it. And the, and the guys and gals that could, trans, that could take the questions that I asked and apply it to what the national security strategy was asking, that's the modern identity. So, yeah. yeah. No, that's great. No, and, I, and I think it's, it's important to not distinguish the difference between you and Scott Mann's kind of analogy there, but I think it is an important kind of um, dive deeper into that discussion uh, that really helps quantify what it is you're trying to build in the, for the future, which is great. Um, I, I love the fact that you brought in the, the kind of cultural aspects and the language. I mean, certainly as, a, as both of us being Arabic linguists, we can appreciate this, but um, just in the nature of, of my business today, um, I, I can't help but want more uh, cultural advisors and linguists helping our, our war fighters. So, um, so I'll always take a plug there. But, but I think what um, the, comp the competence that one can bring is key, sure. And, and you know, maybe my SIGINT background is more, more used to that perfection. But I think as you put it, you know, if you're just building trust, you don't need to be perfect. You just need to have the, um, the willingness to, to try. And, and that can often be enough to, to build that trust. And I think that's huge. And, and understanding the culture, the culture and the country you're going into is obviously critical in that element. Um, so great. And, and, and again, I think this all ties to what you were identified as your kind of organizational Northern star. And that's all, you know, if you have that as your, as your um, kind of beacon to, to align towards all of your actions, all your vision, um, then you're going to get there. Um, and I think, you know, I think you summarized that really well, um, you know, in your, in your dissertation and also just now you kind of talked about the authentic narrative being the only way to recruit. Um, man, I, I, um, I, not that I feel like there's, uh, that I had it different in the Marine Corps, but, but I certainly think there could have been some more honesty about what I was heading into and, and, you know, I probably would have, um, maybe emboldened a teeny bit more loyalty towards my unit that I was going to that I wanted to stay in for longer and maybe give my services to longer uh, if that had been there. So I certainly think um, there's, there's more there to, to pull the thread on, so to speak. Um, you know, training and development, aligning with the mission, the innovating on influence, you know, focusing on people, you know, that's going to improve your accountability to the vision. These are all things that um, I'm kind of taking notes as you're talking and, uh, you know, maybe to sum it all up with one of your last points, asking the hard questions about your own formation and having a nimble architecture. I mean, that's, and it all ties back into to culture and empathy. If you have uh, the, the cultural understanding and empathy, then you can be nimble in your architecture to, to pivot towards whatever changes you're going to encounter. So anyway, so hopefully I did a, a nice job of, of oh, yeah. at it's least perfect. adequate job of summarizing your thoughts. <laughs> yep. I like the nimble architecture. That's right. Yeah. That's a good yeah. way to put it. No, yeah, perfect. Sure. Great, great. And so, I mean, thank you, Colonel Crew, for being a part of this. Thank you for joining us in, you know, this um, really, very casual, informal way for us to just kind of keep conversations going during the pandemic here. So I appreciate you being a part of it, your work on this topic. I mean, it's playing truly innovative pillars on, in terms of our ability to maintain our position in the, in the information revolution, as you put it. Um, you know, all of your time today, but also your commitment and, and service, it's just greatly appreciated. So thank you again. Awesome. Thank you very much. Yeah. Masalam. <laughs> and thank you for watching. Uh, these conversations are intended to create productive discourse around topics that are impacting our warfighters today. So if you're participating and watching and your comments and Continuing the conversation beyond this uh, makes it all more valuable. So thank you. And until next time, stay safe and stay healthy.